Hey, it's Brett. This is Brett and some books. Um, welcome back. I took a couple weeks off because I had ear surgery and some other stuff going on. Um, we'll resume the horse and his boy soon. Um, but I wanted to do a little bit of history uh, as well. So this is The Mysteries of History by Graham Donald, um, and the first section is called Smoke and Mirrors. This one is Joan of Arc, a French flight of fancy. Many accounts of Joan of Arc portray her as a heroine of the early 15th century. They tell of her leading the French armies to countless victories over the English invaders and their Burgundian allies before she was captured and burned as a witch in the marketplace of Rouen. But, in fact, among other things, it seems she wasn't French, she never commanded any army, or even fought in battle, and she was not executed for witchcraft. So, how did such inaccuracies build to create this iconic character? She was born in 1412 at Don Remy Lorraine, and... In an independent duchy not assimilated into France until 1766. Her father was Jacques Darce. His name was variously presenting as Dark, Stark, and even Tars, but not Dark, as the apostrophe was never used in 15th century French names, and there was no such place as Arc from which he could have hailed. Her mother was Isabelle de Vuthon, and she, both she and Jacques elected to be known in the surname of Rome, although it is unclear which of them, if either, had undertaken the pilgrimage, the pilgrimage to Rome to qualify for such usage. Their daughter was Christian Jehamia, not Jeanne or Joan, and it was not until the 19th century that the epithet Jean d'Arc or Joan of Arc appeared through a misreading of Dark. During her alleged lifetime, she was referred to as La Pouchelle, the maid. The Romains were not simple, were not of simple peasant stock. Jacques was a highly successful farmer and leading citizen who allegedly threatened to strangle her, Jeannette with my own hands if she goes into France. From that, if nothing else, we may safely assume that the people of Don Remy considered themselves to be anything but French. What are you doing, kitty? All right, don't fight in the cat. Much that is told of Jeannette comes from chronicles discovered in the Notre Dame in the 19th century but not everyone is convinced that these documents are genuine. According to Roger Caratini, regarded by some to be one of France's most prestigious historians, I'm very much afraid that precious little of what we have, of what we French have been taught in school about Joan of Arc is true. She was, it seems, almost entirely the creation of France's desperate need for a patriotic mascot in the 19th century. The country wanted a hero, the myths of the revolution were altogether too bloody, and France more or less invented the story of its patron saint. The reality is, sadly, a little different. Joan of Arc played no role, or at best only a very minor one, in the Hundred Years' War. She was not the liberator of Orleans, for the simple reason that the city was never besieged, and the English had nothing to do with her death. I'm afraid it was the Inquisition and the University of Paris that tried and sentenced her. I'm afraid the fact of the matter is that we were the ones who killed our national hero. We may have a problem with the English, but as far as Joan's concerned, we really shouldn't. And as a sidebar, there is this entry, Imaginary Voices. Little interest was shown in the shadowy figure of Joan even in France, until Napoleon decided to resurrect her as a cult figure. 
but if she really did lead her sub-commanders to such stunning victories in the Hundred Years' War, where are all the glowing testimonies from them? All we really have is a vague tale of a young woman who heard voices and, quote, saw things. She is said to have claimed that her two main voices were those of St. Margaret of Antioch and St. Catherine of Alexandria, while in her time the reality of these two was accepted, it has since been established beyond the doubt of even the most fervent hagiophile that neither in fact existed. This leaves us with the likely fictitious heroine, allegedly guided by the voices of two other women who did not exist, but none of this prevented her from being canonized in 1920. And back to the main story, Caratini is by no means alone in thinking Joan a 19th century invention, or, at best, quote, one of the many maids who followed the army carrying a banner on the same daily pay as an archer, end quote. France, at the time, was in turmoil. Assisted by their allies, the Burgundians, the English were in control of vast swaths of the country, resulting in the French court relocating to the safety of Chenon and the Loire. If the entire legend is to be accepted at face value, then we are required to believe that an uneducated 16-year-old farm girl, who could barely write her own name, simply rode down to Chenon and having unerringly picked out the dauphin who was hiding among his own courtiers to test her, told him of her, quote, voices, end quote, and repeated a few prophecies before sauntering out as a battle commander. Even if the dauphin had been daft enough to make such an appointment, it is realistic to believe that the battle-hardened troops assigned to her banner would have meekly followed, given that she knew nothing of tactics and weaponry, had the maid been the stuff of her own legend? It is puzzling that the first biographical work purporting to detail her life was not written until the 17th century by Edmund Richer, head of the Faculty of Theology at the Sorbonne in Paris, his manuscript lying unpublished in archives until 1911. After Richer, the next to tackle the subject was Nicolas Lenglet du Fresnoy, in 1753, followed another century later by Jules Kishra, who, be, who beavered away to produce a five-volume work that most accept as the definitive work of the maid's life, trial, and death. But on what foundations do these three works rely? One from the 17th century, a second from the 18th century, and a final work from the 19th century hardly constitute an unbroken chain of observation and assessment leading back to the early 15th century. There are more than a few misconceptions attached to the legend of her trial, which did not result from accusations of witchcraft raised against her by the French Inquisition, a precursor to the more infamous Spanish Inquisition. According to the aforementioned Notre Dame documents, the only representative of that body present at the trial was Jean Le Maitre, who, ignoring threats from the English contingent, kept raising objections over the illegality and shambolic ineptitude of the proceedings. The maid was tried for claiming that the voices she heard were of divine origin and for wearing male attire in contravention of the dictate expressed in the Bible the book of Deuteronomy 22.5, which forbade any kind of cross-dressing. There were allegedly other charges related to her wearing armor and disporting herself at the head of an army, but this too fails to ring true, as women in armor leading 14th and 15th century armies were far more common than one might imagine today. Jeanne de Montfort organized the defense of Hennebon before, clad in armor and at the head of a 300-strong column of cavalry, she fought her way through to Brest. In 1346, Philippa of Hennebon, wife of the English king Edward III, led an army against 12,000 Scottish invaders in her husband's absence. Also in the 14th century, Jean de Beville, 
the lioness of Brittany, divided her time between preying on English shipping in the Channel and leading her army in northern France. And, in 1383, none other than Pope Boniface wrote of, in glowing terms of the deeds of the Genoese ladies who, clad in their armor, fought in the Crusades. Margaret of Denmark, Jeanne de Penthiv, Jacqueline of Bavaria, Isabella of Lorraine, and Jeanne de Chatillon were all, all wore armor and led armies in their time. And please forgive my pronunciation, I don't know French. Even the treacherous Burgundians, allied to the English invaders and so clamorous for the maid's death, had female artillery squads. France was teeming with martial maidens in armor, and if this failed to irk the Pope, why would the clerics of Rouen get so enraged over one more example? More suspicions are raised by the alleged trial records, which depict the defendant as a highly articulate and well-read person who engaged in such stunningly erudite banter with her prosecutors and demonstrated such a grasp of the finer points of theology that she grew grudging admiration even from those determined she would burn. At the time of her alleged trial, she would have been just nineteen and still illiterate, so such impressive knowledge seems unlikely. It also seems clear that, if indeed the trial and execution happened, she did not, as legend would have it, stick to her guns until the bitter end. On the morning of 24 May 1431, she was taken out for execution and, faced with such a gruesome end, she opted to recant all in exchange. She acknowledged that her voices were not divine and promised to shun male attire in the future. Her abjuration was accepted, but when the bishops paid her a surprise visit in prison on 29th of May, they again found her dressed as a man and immediately pronounced her a relapsed heretic who should burn at the stake the very next day. Tied to a stake in Ruin's old market on the 30th of May, 1431, this is supposedly what happened. To further cloud the issue, some maintain that the so-called maid did not burn at... Did not burn at ruin because documents found that the city's archives purport the city officials to have authorized a payment of 210 lires for her services rendered at her siege of the said city, said city, end quote, on August 1439. These highly suspect documents were credited out by the French politician. Francois Daniel Poich, at the close of the 18th century, and given credence the following century by the Belgian antiquarian Joseph Octave de la Pierre. In 1898, Dr. E. Cobham Brewer, he of Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable fame, fame, wrote, M. Octave de la Pierre has published a pamphlet called Dut Historique, to deny the tradition that Joan of Arc was burned at ruin for sorcery. He cites a document discovered by Father Vignier in the 17th century in the archives of Metz to prove that she became the wife of Sieur de Amoise, Amois, with whom she resided at Metz and became the mother of a family. Vignier subsequently found in the family monument chest that the contract of marriage between Robert de Amois, knight, and Jean de Arcy, surnamed the Maid of Orleans. In 1740, there were found in the archives of the Mason de Ville de Orleans records of several payments to certain messengers from Joan to her brother John, bearing the dates of 1435-1436. There is also the entry of a presentation from the council of the city of the maid, of the city to the maid, for her services at the siege, dated 1439. M. de la Pierre has brought forward a host of other documents to corroborate the same fact, 
and show that the tale of her martyrdom was invented to throw odium on the English. There are other sources that claim Joan was alive after 1431. The ancient registers of the Mason de Ville, Orleans, and the Chronicle of the Dean of St. Thibault de Metz both make reference to post-ruin Joan. Poyuche laid out his arguments in Problème Historique sur la Dépêcheur de Orleans, forming in part the foundation for Delapierre, who first published his findings in the Athenian, dated 15th of September, 1855. Either way, there seems to be a great deal of doubt as to the veracity of the tale of Joan of Jeanne d'Arc, with major question marks over every detail from her name and nationality right through to her exploits, trial, and death. That's the end of that one.